Thank you, Mandy, and uh, thank you so much to you and Yara for, uh, for setting this up. I'm just incredibly grateful for everything you've done uh, over this week, and I'm really excited about this talk. Um, I'm obviously very grateful that you're here. Um, my idea of a kind of relaxing Sunday night is probably not uh, sort of historical gloom in mid 19th century Algeria, but you're a more sophisticated crowd than me, I can, I, I can tell. As Mandy said, I've, I've been working on Colonial Algeria for probably about 10 years or so. The things that I'm going to be talking about tonight are, are actually new, and I guess that's why I'm you know, excited about it. Um, they draw on things which I've done, but they're not things I've ever really presented on before. Um, so I really would like questions and, and feedback, and I'm ha as happy with dissent as, uh, as with agreement. The work that I uh, did before in Algeri Algeria. Oops. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> If you don't sign the book, <laughs> Lawson don't get the money. Um, was really in, in two areas, but in the same period of time that I'm going to be talking about today. And the first book was about, uh, as you can see, medicine and ethics. Um, and the second book was about uh, violence. And uh, this work on the early history of the colony um, uh, is, is something that I've been doing along with quite a number of other people in the last uh, decade. There's been a big revival in the interest of the early history of the French presence in Algeria. Uh, for a long time, the focus understandably was much more on the 20th century, on the War of Independence, on Fanon, um, and indeed on the politics and then the horrors of the post-independence period. Um, but there's been a whole series of uh, different works over the last few years and I just wanted to um, introduce you to a couple of them because they may be things uh, that are of interest. Uh, they're all very good. Um, the first is a book called A Desert Named Peace, uh, which is Benjamin Brower's book about the way that the French conquered uh, the Algerian Sahara. Um, and this is really a, the second phase of the conquest. The part that I'm going to be talking about today uh, involved the uh, domination of the coastal area uh, and the Kabyle Mountains. Um, only when those areas were secured did the French move south. Uh, there's also another very interesting, uh, perhaps more contested book, come out very recently with Harvard by Abdul Majid Hanoum called Violent Modernity France and Algeria and you can probably tell from the title that um, this has a sort of rather grand and more sweeping thesis um, which argues that if you want to, want to understand the ways in which modernity is violent then you need to understand Algeria. Um, the reason why it's been relatively controversial is that there are sort of two polarised positions with regard to uh, writing on the history of Algeria. One of which says that the violence of the past continues through time right to our present. So if you want to understand the Algerian civil war of the 1990s, civil war that's arguably continuing in some ways, you need to understand the colonial history of the 1950s, the 1850s, the 1830s. And another school which says that's rubbish, these things are distinct um, and one ought to, to recognise that. And Majid uh, uh, Hanoum is very much in the first camp of saying Algeria was made as a violent place. Um, Algeria has also uh, recently started to interest um, in a tiny way the field of settler colonial studies um, and I imagine that some of you here because you're interested in, in that particular field um, if one looks at the literature um, that exists almost all of it has been on the 
the Anglophone world and, uh, and on Israel. Um, very little has been written with regard to the French Empire and in particular um, Algeria, which is of course notionally the only French uh, settler colony. So one of the things that I'm going to try and do in the background of this talk is to insert France and the French Empire into those debates. And in doing so, I'm trying to nod to the great work which people like uh, Lorenzo Veracini and Patrick Wolfe uh, have done over the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, and indeed, people like Dirk Moses working on the comparative history of genocide, especially in the colonial period, to, to situate Algeria in those debates. And I'm sure you're, you're, you're well aware that the economic dimension has been uh, of colossal interest to uh, historians of, of settler colonialism. Um, so that's the, one of the connections that I'm, I'm hoping to make today. And as Mandy said at the beginning, my, my thesis is that the French conquest of Algeria was achieved by economic means in this period running from the invasion in 1830 through to the pacification of <coughs> the sort of north and central areas of the country uh, in the middle of the 1840s. And that the traditional stress in historical writing on Algeria on either politics or the military misses out a very important dimension of what was happening there. And to say that is, is also to say that much of that historical writing also misses out on another important dimension, which is the lives of the indigenous peoples of Algeria. Because if one looks at the classic texts on Algeria in the 19th century, most of them are fairly addicted to the kind of progressive unfolding narrative that you find in histories of war and histories of empire. And then they conquered this, and then we conquered that, or they conquered this, or we, or we conquered that. And it was a dangerous and terrible thing, and then we moved on to the next place. And then certain kinds of uh, infrastructure were established in these places, and so on and so forth. And this is what life is life on the frontier. And of course we know this from you know, other historical settings. Um, and often it's the, the figure of the, 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 the indigenous person um, who kind of lies curiously absent from these kinds of narratives. Um, so part of the aim is, is, is also, in particular, to look at the way that uh, economics was understood by French soldiers and French colonial administrators and how they perceived it as a weapon, a form of violence which could be used... Uh, as a means of subjugating this difficult territory. Um, and I hope by the end you'll, you'll think that uh, I've at least provided some evidence for, for feeling that this uh, might have been the case. I guess like a lot of projects, this one began by accident. I had no intention of writing about this. Um, when I was working on my uh, book on violence, I... I scanned lots and lots of images from the French military archives. Um, and I, I sat at home in, in England, kind of scrolling through these, I don't know, 10, 15,000 photographs. Um, and I would get progressively more and more irritated going through the day uh, because so many of them seem to uh, consist of lists of the number of goats that have been sold in a market how much those goats have been sold for um, and where the goats had come from. Um, and at the time I was thinking, forget the goats, show me the violence. I'm writing a book about violence. I'm, I'm, I'm not as interested in uh, you know, the price of camels uh, in a particular market. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, as, as tends to happen, um, after a while something at the, the back of your mind says, there must be something relatively interesting about this. Why does an occupying army spend so much of its effort, eff its effort so much of its, uh, its time in creating knowledge 
in focusing on the productive capacities of the land um, and tracking it in this microscopic detail. Um, and I guess this is what got me thinking about this um, particular topic. And of course, in some ways it makes sense because armies need to feed themselves and armies need to move places um, and in the case of Algeria one is talking about a very large standing army um, by 1840 10 years after the arrival of the French there were 100,000 soldiers based in Algeria um, and these were poorly fed um, uh, soldiers often living on the very margins of, of existence. So food was important in terms of uh, serving those men. Uh, but food clearly meant something more to uh, the French army. And what I think all of these documents together reveal is that the army came to see economic subjugation as the means of pacifying the land. And in particular, so long as there existed the possibility of living outside a new kind of national economy, the French did not believe they had truly conquered the land. So they were determined to both destroy local ecologies, the possibilities that local people had for production, and they were determined to insert all of those people who they had, had, had conquered into this incredibly new, modern, in the eyes of someone like Abdul Majid Hanoum, modern form of economy in which the state controlled everything. The price of everything, the movement of everything, um, and was able to manipulate populations through these economic levers. One of the reasons why I began to think that this might be interesting was that there's a later literature on the history of Algeria which comes from the 1860s, the 1870s and the 1880s. And that literature looks at the way in which uh, Algerians were pushed into an industrialising economy. Um, and in particular the way that uh, forced migration from the countryside to the cities uh, pushed uh, many Algerians into lives of the kind of um, industrial servitude which of course people also knew in Europe but which existed without any of the kinds of you know, welfareist controls which began to be developed in Europe. And this is a subject of of, of interest to historians of the later uh, 19th century in part because if you look at the demography of the time you can prove quite conclusively that those people not, in, not only lived um, uh, lives that were diminished in the sense that they were now part of an industrial capitalised regime but they also lived shorter lives in the cities that the French had established. You may have noticed that uh, before I began I had a, a slide up. Um, little by little try to encourage the Arabs to accept our money. This is uh, a quotation that I found in the document from Marshal Bougeau who was the French Governor General uh, of Algeria in the key period from the very late 1830s through the 1840s. And the kind of plan of economic domination that I'm talking about today was very much the idea of a small group of elites in Algeria and in the metropolitan France. And there's no doubt in my mind the two key figures were Bougeot in Algeria and Soult, uh, Marshal Soult, who had been a Napoleonic general 
who for much of this period served either as Minister of Defence uh, or effectively Prime Minister. At some point he served in, in, in both posts. And this particular quotation came from uh, a letter which Bouger wrote to one of his generals uh, and I think emblemises this idea that, that, that the French had that if they were able by force and persuasion to direct Algerians into this new form of economy then they would have captured their bodies and they would have captured the body of, of, of the land. And this is not a, an especially remarkable quotation. One finds lots and lots of instances of money being talked about in this fashion in the early colony. So, for example, another letter from Bougeot in the same year, he wrote to another general uh, uh, that uh, 4,800 francs have parted from, from here to a Clemson. Um, and he talked about money and the travel of money as if it was you know, a battalion of troops. The money was going to do the fighting. Um, and in terms of the language he uses, it's exactly the same. Uh, and in this particular letter, he reminded the general that he was writing to that he and his men should only pay for the services they acquired, for transport, for other services using French money. And they had to ensure that local populations, uh, in this particular case, local Jews were specified, that they did the same, under, pain, under penalty of being chased away. Most especially, it was important that the Jews did not use Spanish currency. Um, and that if they did so, the Governor General recommended that an, an example be made of them. Uh, for their use of a currency which uh, was not in the control of the French. Now, as you'll probably imagine, uh, the, the period that I'm talking about is, is not one where the economy is absolutely absent in existing literatures. It is there to some extent. Um, and the two places that one finds it are, one, the huge cost of the occupation, because as I said, the standing army was, was massive, um, 100,000 men. And there's also an interesting economic dimension uh, in Algeria, which comes from the fact that, uh, like a lot of European colonies in the middle of the 19th century, they were as interesting to political radicals as they were to political conservatives, especially political radicals on the left. So the, the followers of Saint-Simon uh, in France were fascinated by Algeria, and they saw Algeria as a place where they might be able to experiment in ways they couldn't uh, at home. Um, and of course some of them got the opportunity to do this because in 1848, the courts sent them off to Algeria. Um, uh, rather than sending them to prison, the French state thought um, that it would be more productive to send these kind of political dissidents to Algeria to help make the state. And I think there's actually something quite interesting about this because what one sees in this uh, uh, French effort to establish a new kind of economic control is an alliance of all kinds of different political groupings. And actually it's exactly the same thing that's taking place in France at this time. So for example, if you look at the 1830s and the 1840s, um, Walter Benjamin says, the thing you should be interested in is the railways. Why should you be interested in the railways? should be interested in the railways because their creation was avidly supported by the most reactionary forces of, of capital and the most revolutionary political groups in the society. Um, and he writes about these kinds of alliances which were forged 
around features of the world which were deemed to be progressive, be they the railways, be they the uh, new forms of urban planning, the beautification of the city, or empire. So I think that the, the things that I'm talking about in Algeria, they're also things which are, are happening at home. As I said, the soldiers who were in Algeria were under-resourced. They were often suffering. Um, more and more soldiers in Algeria, Algeria died of malnutrition, disease and alcohol than ever died in combat. Um, looking at, at numbers, I spent uh, another period of time counting up casualties year by year. And interestingly, in the most bloody years of the, the conquest of the Kabyle in the 1840s, uh, I found some years where, where less than 100 French soldiers died. Um, whereas in those years, thousands were dying of drink, lack of food, suicide, um, and these kinds of things. And if we look at the um, stories, the letters, the documents which soldiers leave behind, you get a vivid impression of um, uh, this kind of life that they, that they led. And I'll quote from a couple. Um, one is from uh, a soldier who, called Duquang who lamented the fact that Algeria was so poor uh, as compared with the situations that other colonists enjoyed. And he said that while an English expedition in India might be rewarded with the sight of a land of spices and busy towns, or the Russian in the Caucasus with the rich basins of the Taurid, our soldiers, by contrast, are faced only by the desert, the land of thirst, as they call it. They know that even victory will simply impose new privations upon them. For each ten-day mission began with rations of meat, biscuits, rice and coffee, which would last only a week, forcing them, if Arazia did not come to their aid, to turn to the provisions of the desert, rats, snakes, tortoises, gerbils and roots. Um, I've never come across um, text before about tortoises and gerbils uh, in, in this particular context and it's always it, 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 it's it, it's always struck me. Um, and as you also alluded to in this particular uh, uh, text, one of the ways that the French soldiers solved this problem was through the thing which they called uh, Fahadia. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this in, in, in great detail, but I'm happy to, to, to talk about it at, at, at the end. But the, the term Fahadia in, in French obviously comes from uh, has, an, has an Arabic root it's a perversion of uh, the term Ghazwa um, it's the, one of the only words in Arabic which migrates into French in the 1830s and the 1840s it becomes a noun, it becomes a verb it's used incredibly prolifically uh, in military circles and as I said it, it's a kind of perversion because it changes the meaning quite radically from the original form of, sort of limited assault of one group on another, which might include the taking of possessions or, or livestock, to become something much, much more brutal. But it also included, in the franchise, the taking of food, the taking of livestock from uh, those groups who they confronted. So as Duquang said, and we find in lots of other texts, I'll quote from uh, a writer called de Castellan from 1843. He, he described a razia that had exceeded beyond all hope. Thanks to the measures taken by our commandant, we made, despite our small number, considerable captures. At eight o'clock in the morning, we rejoined the colonel, bringing with us 34 prisoners, 117 oxen, 10 horses, mules, 30 asses, and 1,500 sheep and goats having killed beside 20 Arabs. There was abundance for three months. Joy was on all our faces, and our ordinary dinner became a festival. Much better than Jerks. 
So the idea that conquering uh, tribes, especially recalcitrant tribes who uh, would not accept the political rule of the French was also a way of not just feeding yourself but feeding yourself in these great feasts that would last for months, which is something that was powerfully ingrained in the French military mentality uh, at this time. And this was something which was created on the ground, but it was also directed by the military political leadership that I have talked about. It was theorised by Bougeot and Soult as a particular method of war and one that would generate a kind of place in which there was life for one kind of person and death for another kind of person and described in these quite explicit terms. So, as the 1830s moved into the 1840s, for strategic reasons, Bourgeois and Soult decided that they needed to rely more and more on these kinds of assaults on indigenous groups, not just to feed the army, but because they were proving effective in definitively subjugating these peoples. Um, and this was partly related to a set of political debates which were taking place back home. In particular, the so-called Algerian question. Because, I mean, if we think of our own times, if we think of wars and how long they last and domestic audiences and the press and publics and their appetite for war, one could imagine that in France in 1840, after 10 years of fighting, in Algeria, many at home, in the press, in politics, other publics, were saying, what are we doing? Why are we spending all of this money? Why are we wasting all of these lives? You know, what would be the payback for France? And in order to resolve this situation, Bougeot and Soult turned to the military tactics that were proving most effective in terms of ending the conflict uh, at any cost. And they enjoyed uh, a whole series of Hadia, especially across the um, Kabil areas, um, which took a number of different forms, often linked. Um, they famously included the burning and asphyxiation of, of indigenous peoples. Um, and this was uh, a source of, of, of considerable uh, interest in Europe, not just in France, but in Britain and across the continent when it was made public. Um, it was only really made public in a limited number of cases, um, but it came to symbolise the absolute brutality uh, in the minds of some of the French Empire in Africa. Um, in fact, it was relatively commonplace um, uh, at this particular moment. But there's, there's one massacre in particular at a place called Dakra, which is uh, much studied because uh, news was surreptitiously passed to the French newspapers of what, of what had taken place in this particular massacre. But these massacres were also accompanied by um, determined efforts, as I've said, to wipe out the capacity of indigenous peoples to live independent economic lives. Um, so this involved the the destruction of their habitats, the cutting down of the orchards, um, the burning of the harvests, the theft of um, the wheat which had been hidden in silos in the mountains, um, and of course the physical destruction of the villages that they lived in. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite keen on the, the idea that um, violence at this moment shouldn't just be considered in terms of its sort of most obvious form of massacres, um, but also in this continuum of activities, each of which was motivated by the same kind of goals. 
And this was often expressed in uh, quite explicit economic terms. Uh, so I'm going to quote from a letter from Soult, the uh, Prime Minister of the time in 1842, who wrote to Bougeot saying, Sooner or later it would be necessary to begin operations against the Kabyle. It is of the greatest importance that we establish lines of communication between, on the one hand, Gigeli and Bougie, and on the other, Setif and Constantine, as soon as possible. I have no doubt that the commercial benefits which will ensue will serve as a powerful means of acting against the inhabitants of these mountains. So we're doing up here this, this notion, we're talking here about Bougie and Constantine, uh, Gigeli, just over here, we're talking about areas uh, up on the coast and into the mountains of the Kabyle. This quite explicit description from the highest political power that commercial interests should be seen as a weapon deployed against the British people. Another document from this time, uh, this was another letter from Soult to de Bougeot. Uh, this was a confidential letter uh, in which he said, the Arabs who are not able to sell these products will in the long run become almost as poor as those who are prevented from producing. And we should see that this is a powerful means of impoverishment from which we must learn to profit. Free access to markets must become the price of alliance with us or, at the very least, a real and sincere submission. So I'm, I hope you in some kind of agreement that the kind of things I'm talking about here are, are not um, covert in any sense. Um, you don't have to read between the lines. Um, uh, these things were, were stated, in many ways, quite clearly as being the policy of the state, um, or even they were secretly um, uh, 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 described in these kinds of terms. And this notion that Algeria would become a place where there were two markets, the market of life, the market of death, um, is of course one that uh, connects to another body of literature that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And I'm thinking here of uh, Mike Davis's uh, great, if controversial, book, um, Late Victorian Holocaust, El Nino Famines and the Making of the Third World, and of course that's the body of, of literature on the second of settler colonialism. And I think the reason why there's an interesting connection here is that Davis's work on colonial genocide which is especially focused on the period 1870 to, to 1900, um, was new, I think, in the sense that he connected it very much to the colonial management of environments. And his argument was that the colossal scale of death which one saw in empire in the last decades of the 19th century was causally and intimately connected to the way that colonial powers managed markets and had changed the kinds of environments in which people lived. And this, I think, is the same kind of thing that one sees in Algeria. In particular, when we are often talking about people whose economies and ecologies were often on the margins of existence as they were as were some of the cases that Davis looked at in uh, Egypt and India and other places, that these were not uh, uh, always people who could survive for more than a year or two of disastrous harvests. Um, and I, I think, I mean, his, his work, whether one agrees with the kind of the idea of talking about late Victorian Holocaust and, and all of the other kinds of questions that brings into play. I, I think his, his work is, is, is incredibly important in terms of developing a new understanding of the 19th century in terms of 
uh, die-outs and the relationship between the die-outs of indigenous peoples and colonial uh, economic uh, policies. Um, and of course one, one sees this a great deal as, as well in, in literature on Australia, um, which I suppose has, has, has really been the, the touchstone from which other settler colonial studies have, have, have developed. And there are all sorts of reasons for thinking that Australia and Algeria are incredibly analogous cases. Um, things happen at almost exactly the same moment. Um, and in the period that I'm talking about, um, around a third of the Algerian population disappeared um, between about 1830 and 1860. Um, it could have been more than this. Our demographic histories of the period are remarkably incomplete, um, but about a third is, is, is a reasonably conservative. Now, one of the other reasons for thinking this was important is that if one looks at texts by, uh, by Arabs, by Kabil, from this moment, they show a realisation of the things uh, that, are, that are happening. Um, and we sometimes find this secondhand in French records. And I want to quote from uh, 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 one particular document where a French officer bemoaned the fact that as soon as we mount an offensive, the Arabs move their women and their herds to secure locations. They have no other real riches excepting those which they secrete in their silos. But these places are well hidden, and up until now we've had little luck in finding them. Here, then, are the only means by which we might capture these unseizable Arabs. We must, at all costs, find their silos, take their women and children and herds, making the women and children hostage, using the livestock to feed our troops, and impose some of the costs of war upon our enemy. Um, and this notion of imposing the costs of war on the enemy had actually been there right from the start. Um, France had gone to Algeria in the belief that um, there was a moral case for arguing that the cost of occupation, uh, when it was designed to uh, around a civilizing mission, should be borne equally by the French person, by Algerians, um, actually remarkably so by uh, Algerians. And if we look at reports of Hazia from this, uh, uh, this moment, there's a very real sense that soldiers on the ground believed that they had succeeded in their missions if they could determine some kind of economic outcome. Um, so I'm going to quote from another document from 1842. This is from a colonel called Bravo to the Governor General in which he described a campaign of burning and vast fires in a place called Uzera. Uh, he also said that he returned to this particular tribe a group of hostages uh, and he believed that this act of generosity was likely to have some influence on the remainder of the tribe. Though he also described them as useless mouths, uh, um, which I think is quite telling, because presumably he couldn't have afforded to have fed them. Um, he said, if they had not promptly agreed to such a peace, I would have burned and raised all of the tribes who surrounded me. And then two days later, later he reported in a very pleased fashion, the Arabs began to frequent our markets, bringing cattle and other provisions. So this was the proof of the success. That once these people had no choice but to buy and to sell in French markets, this was the true form of capture. Um, and these were obviously related to the, the kinds of slides which annoyed me when I began this project. The detailed tracking of the prices of goods, who was buying what, where they were coming from, where the goods were going to, um, right across the new colonial state. So just as a form of illustration, um, 
One such report from the market of, of Mascara said, 1842, the Arabs who come to our markets have been spending a great deal of money in the square. At first they requ- frequented the Moorish cafes. Then they bought a great number of cotton, silks, Indian fabrics, handkerchiefs and other materials before acquiring foodstuffs such as sugar, coffee, salt and pepper. In general, they went on to export many of the goods acquired in the market via merchants. One of the things, we, if you look in detail at the prices uh, in these markets, is that the French operated with um, a very strange notion of how economics work. Now, of course, lots of people have operated I guess most of us still do operate with really strange notions of how economics works, but that was especially so in the 19th century. But they, they operated with a notion of the economy which was peculiarly self-serving. Um, and I want to look at a little, little example of this as a, a kind of prelude to the end, end of the talk. Um, and this came from... Uh, uh, Again, the market at Mascara. And I found this data accompanied by a note from a French official who said that Arabs receive a great deal of money for the farmyard animals which they hire to merchants who transport goods between Oran and Mostaganem. So the note says, Arabs get a lot of money from hiring these animals. And... The statistics would be, or the amount of money that people got over a short period of time for these things. So in January, the, the cost of hiring an, an, an animal was 120 francs. In February, it was 100 francs. In March, it was initially 80 francs. It went down to 60, then down to 40. By April, it was 25. And the report says, we think it's going to go lower. Now this is, this is included here as a proof of the kind of economic prosperity which Arabs are enjoying. And of course, what it actually reveals is that once you have captured the economic capacity of people in their totality, the prices go down and down and down, and their capacity to live through this kind of trade diminishes. Um, and we know this from, from lots of other uh, colonial situations. I mean, if one looks at um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the prices, for example, of uh, animals in colonial families, um, where one might think that the scarcity of these resources which allow for life would lead the price to rise, invariably the, the reverse is the case. Um, the price declines because people need to sell the only assets that they have in order to have any small grip on life. Um, and I just think this is incredibly telling that this collapse in the value of one of the few goods which these tribes had available to them takes place over such a short period of time, and obviously years, we're talking months. And I just want to conclude by, by saying that uh, I think one of the reasons why this might be um, of some interest to settler colonial studies beyond Algeria is that the French case is an interesting one because What we're talking about here is the development of militarised capitalism. An army which assumes control of an economy. Um, This is not a colonial venture which is a joint enterprise between politicians, settlers on the frontier, civilian settlers on the frontier and an army. This is an enterprise which is absolutely dominated by an army. And the next stage of the story is the one in which the army, having captured the economy, having captured the Algerian peoples of these these areas, then starts to talk about how it's going to make money 
from these lands. Now, as was the case in many colonies, that didn't really prove to be the case. But as in other colonies, the very act of being able to say, as a settler, to the imperial masters, we have reached a stage where the bounteous riches are going to start flying back home was incredibly compelling. It was a narrative which, um, uh, which politicians, which other forms of power uh, wanted to believe. And I think this is one of the reasons why Algeria begot, be, belongs essentially to the modern period of empire rather than the, uh, the pre-modern period. This is not... People often say uh, Algeria was France in India. Um, it obviously wasn't France in India in the sense that uh, that kind of commercially driven early imperialism which was led as much by uh, commercial interests at home as it was by the state or militaries and which needed to make money in order to survive and which understood that to do this you couldn't necessarily obliterate local economies in the manner, the manner that the French did uh, is hugely different I think to the kind of things that one finds in Algeria which is why uh, I would suggest that Algeria belongs much more to the category of those other settler colonies. 